Hi, welcome to EBIT in Vilnius. I'm Gerd Leonhardt, futurist, keynote speaker, humanist, and author of Technology and Humanity. Today, with a story about the future, what's going to happen in the next five to seven years, what do we have to pay attention to, and how do we get a future mindset? Right. The question of the future mindset, of course, has been booming lately because now all we're all wondering what's going to happen after the corona crisis and what kind of impact will this have on our economy our jobs and our future and on europe right? one thing i've learned as a futurist over the last uh, decade or so uh, is that the future is no longer an extension of the present or of course the past right? it is actually completely different because we're living in a world with exponential technological change which means the conditions of how we live the circumstance, the frame, is becoming different every time there's a new invention, and it's an exponential change. So it's very hard to say, you know, this is what we have tomorrow, and then in five years it'll be like this from there. It's much better to say, well, what can we expect in the future, in the next, say, 10 years, the end of oil, renewable, uh, sustainable energy, uh, the United States of Europe, as I will tell you later, and then work backwards from there, and decide how we're going to respond. You know, if this is the future, what are you going to do? When I was in the music business, I talked a lot about the future, and I talked to people about this idea of saying, well, the music is moving to the cloud, which is what we have today. That was 1999. And how do we react? And how do we fix a, make a business model out of this? So it's very important. The future is not an extension of the present. It is a new place. Of course, it hangs together, but yeah, let's think about it like this. And when we think about the future, let's not obsess too much on the ideas of predicting it. It's really about observation. And one thing that's important for observation is to know the game changes as they're going by here, right? Whether it's quantum computing or artificial intelligence or lang natural language processing, you can find out more if you look for game changes and GERD, G-E-R-D, my name. You'll find more on this. But, but the reality is that, you know, we're expecting the future to arrive gradually, but it's not, right? It's, it's, like, it's like warp drive. And now COVID-19 has accelerated the arrival of that future. And now it's going like, like gangbusters. I mean, it's basically just, just exploding in speed and, and moving as fast as we can imagine. So it's important to think, you know, the future is now a mindset. It's not tomorrow. Either you have a future mindset or maybe you're working on your future mindset, but those that cannot imagine the future will be in deep trouble going forward. As Einstein once said, imagination is more important than knowledge. I think knowledge is important if you're not Einstein who had lots of knowledge, but in any case, it's really the combination of the two. But a future mindset, what is that? How do we get better at understanding the future? Not predicting it, but feeling it, sensing it hearing it, paying attention to it. And to me, that is, the, again, the key question is that we, we don't really want to keep asking what will the future bring. It's not very empowering. It's like, you know, the Americans make the future, you know, Silicon Valley or China or whoever else, but not me, right? The reality is the future doesn't just fall down on us. It just doesn't just happen to us. We make it by action, by inaction. The real question we should be asking is what do we want our future to look like? What kind of future do I want to leave for my children and you know, have ready for them to, to dive into the, this future? And how will it be achieved? That's the key question, not what I can have, because you know, technology in 10 years will be almost limitlessly powerful. Uploading my brain to the internet, traveling virtually in holograms, that's not science fiction any longer. Uh, be it 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, but not 500 years. <laughs> so what kind of future do I want, do we want, in your country, in your city, in your region, in Europe and worldwide, and, and how will we best create it? You know, and of course, we'd have to agree on what kind of future we want globally, and, and that will not be an easy discussion, but I, I do have hope that we're getting there. I think we're living in the time of great pivoting, and that's really powered also by Corona. Now we're thinking like, okay, maybe we should do things differently. Big state, big tech, big media. It's like a giant shakeup. You know, we had the world before Corona, and now it's like going through a massive shakeup, and new things are rising to the top. For example, other people, solidarity, and of course, a better healthcare system, a better prepared system, renewable energy, working from home, technology. 
uh, and the role of the state. I mean, it's a, a huge uh, time of transformation. That's why I call this the Great Transformation. The World Economic Forum says the Great Reset. I think we're pretty much on the same agenda here. But there are many, many challenges, and God knows people are suffering and through this. And of course, my own job is changing vastly. I used to be on the stage, and now I'm in here, right? talking to you remotely. Uh, but nevertheless, you know, I think I can make that pivot and I think this is all of our challenge because this is what the crisis has brought to us, right? It's egged on a giant development, big tech, clearly everything is technology, big media, everybody's watching, right? everything is media, Zoom is the next YouTube, <laughs> big state, the role of the government has exploded. Right? The government has its finger on everything now. The basic income is basically here. You know, we're getting paid by the government to keep on working, or not working, rather. Big health, clearly trillions of euros are going to shift into healthcare. The vaccine therapeutics, and I mean, this is clearly a total reallocation of funds, and ultimately big green. We're finally understanding that if we want to make a difference and, and uh, prevent or deal with large emergencies like the virus, the next one is climate change, and we have to be prepared. We have to do something about it now before it gets big and unexpected. You know, we, we knew about the virus for a long time, that it was coming. Bill Gates said, though, Larry, Larry Brilliant said so. But we didn't do anything about it. And I think Big Green is, is basically the next wave. And it's also all of those things are giant generators of jobs right? and new revenues. So I would take a positive view on this and say, well, if that's the case, you know, maybe we can take that as part of our future model. So let's talk about technology. That's very closely related to this whole idea. Uh, in my book, Technology vs. Humanity, I talk about the mega shifts. And the mega shifts are an important part of all of my presentations and talks because basically this is not just one thing that's happening. Uh, it's, it's 10 things. And in the meantime, it's gotten to be almost like 20. You can download this chapter of my book for free at megashifts.digital. So it's a really good read in 10 different languages. And basically what's happening here around us is that we're looking at stuff like automation and cognification, virtualization, being able to do things virtually, and of course, datafication, everything is becoming data. These things are new to us, but now they're all coming together, creating like a giant vortex of change. You have to be familiar with what that means for your company, for your job, for your future, for your kids. This is all not just about technology, it's also changing your social impact, right? It's all warp drive now because of COVID. We're automating more, we're virtualizing more, we're robotizing more, we're changing our supply chain. So it's really in interesting to see how we're going warp drive because of this. I mean, we have this Rubik's Cube of possibilities of science and technology, nanotechnology, the blockchain, the Internet of Things. And what's happening now is we're basically taking them and we're saying, okay, let's take some examples like healthcare, right? Uh, we're now turning healthcare into a future where it's converging with biotechnology, right? Where we are essentially going to redo pharma, medical, healthcare, and it's going to go from sick care to healthcare using data and technology. I mean, talk about an opportunity. There's, there's tens of millions of new jobs here, and, and we're going to need that, clearly, dealing with other pandemics. And that's why uh, I applaud Bill Gates' effort, for example, of, of uh, creating a science behind this, of diagnosing it, and, and uh, creating, of course, the vaccine and so on. And we're going to see a lot of international collaboration, a very good uh, side effect of, the, of this otherwise quite difficult time. And, you know, if we take all these things together in technology, we can say, well, the next frontier is, is the human body. Right? And there we're facing a lot of issues, you know, ethical issues, values, morals, and of course funding. Is this just going to be for rich people? Are rich people going to live to be 150 years old? Uh, that is going to bring up a, a vast discussion about what I call digital ethics that we have to engage in. So technology has opened up a whole bunch of different points. And basically what we can safely say, it's kind of heaven or hell. It could be both, you know, swipe left, swipe right. Right. We can decide, well, is this future going to be terrible? Is it going to be the rule of the robots and no jobs for us? Or is it going to be good? I think it could be amazing. I'm, I'm, an, I'm an optimist on this. We just have to make the right decisions. We have all the tech and science. And just 20 years from now, we'll have pretty much whatever tech or science. I mean, it's mind-boggling, right? So the real question is ultimately no longer 
if and how we can do something, but why? It's a question of purpose. You know, what do we want to be, as I said earlier, and of course the question of who. Who can we trust? Who leads us into the future? You know, where are we going? Why are we going there? Who's leading us? Those questions should be asked every single day of individuals, of politicians, of our CEOs and leaders, countries. Thought leadership, this is really what it's all about. We have to develop thought leadership. We have to get real with the future. Right? And this is something that we urgently need to do in Europe because in the end, this is what it's all about, is the handshake between technology and humanity. It's not rejecting technology. That There's no such thing. We, technology is what we make. And technology is morally neutral until we use it, right? William Gibson, science fiction author. And if we want it to be moral and to be used morally, then, then we have to regulate and we have to make sure we have the right social context, we have the right understanding. And so this is really a question of policy and like, for example, regulating social media. So that, that brings me to this important topic I think that we should talk about because I think what's happening is I used to say 15 years ago, maybe data is the new oil. And that's so true now. I mean, data is the oil. Look at the top of the stock market. That's all data companies, you know, technology companies. And data is exploding as we're all connecting 10 billion people on the internet in 2030. Right? So data is the new oil, but now it's also a weapon. Right? It can be used as a weapon. It can be become plutonium. Right? I mean, social media is using our data as a weapon, a weapon to change elections, to change our mindset, to change our thinking. And there's something we got to do about that. We got to talk to our friend uh, Zuck about this. Right? There's a more proactive role to be taken by those companies. Uh, we have to make sure that they are accountable, that they will do the right thing, that they will not delay action, right? that they will actually uh, give us the rights that we are used to otherwise, that our digital rights and digital ethics is now becoming a top topic in marketing as well. You can see that uh, Unilever and others have pulled out their money from Facebook, I think, as a time of this recording, but who knows what the future will bring for ethical reasons, right? And this company, Braze, did the same thing. I think digital ethics is the topic. Right? How will you use technology in an ethical, in a good for humans way? Will you be responsible or will you just look for the bottom line? Right? So very important here, when we look at this whole issue, technology is powerful, it can be good or bad, a hammer can kill or a hammer can build a house, right? But basically, technology doesn't have ethics, right? It doesn't have purpose or value. I mean, this is the stuff that we must put in it, right? I don't think we should teach robots to have ethics or emotions or to really understand humans in the, in the sense of consciousness or human agency. But we have to make sure that our technology is used correctly as much as we can. And, and this is a big topic, of course, not entirely easy. Right? But we're facing already today a kind of a tech lash. You know? A lot of people are saying, well, technology is cool, but if all that stuff happens, you know, surveillance, people acting like machines and, uh, and social media just deriving money from, from us and using us as, as guinea pigs and, and content fodder, people getting addicted to the internet, you know, we got to think about what that means. You know, we have to think about if we can regulate it in some way. Ethics is knowing the difference between what you have a right or the power to do and what is the right thing to do. Now that's going to be a debate, you know, what is the right thing to do? But that's a question that's unavoidable now because every day we launch a new technology, we have to ask a question, is that the right thing to do? Is it going to result in collective human flourishing, or is it just what what's been called jerk tech? You know, getting us to a, a consequence really big. You know, the consequence being that I can monetize. Right? When you have a startup, you got to think about those things now. Right? And clearly, technology is kind of like this. It can be a present, and in many ways, it has been, but it can also be a bomb. You know, too much of a good thing can be a very bad thing. Too much social media, too much surveillance, too much contact tracing. Yeah, well, I think this is amazing that we can do this, but we have to think about why and who's in charge and who's going to protect us. I go with riffing off Einstein, right? Everything should be as connected as necessary, but not more. Einstein said everything should be as simple as possible, but not more. 
kind of a connected statement, I would say. Right? So this is an important principle for our future. Looking at what we see today in Hollywood motion pictures, this is, this is of course Blade Runner 2046, we have this inkling of the future, and it's been depicted, of course, in many films all over the place, what's going to happen with, with the reality that's being mirrored to us, you know, virtual reality. I think we should be very careful about this to see if that's desirable. I think it has its purpose, just like, you know, making Zoom calls has its purpose, but, you know, fatigue is also quite real. Too much of a good thing can be a very bad thing, and, and, and how do we prevent that from taking over our lives, you know, and dehumanizing us. You know. In the end, technology is not what we seek, but it's how we seek. It is not something that we can find our purpose in. You know, you will never find happiness on the screen or in an AR or a hologram. You'll, you'll find, you know, hedonistic relationships. Well, that's not necessarily a bad thing, it's just uh, we have to keep the perspective. And that takes me to my next point, which is about capitalism. You know, our current system has proven to be useless when it's about fighting big market failures. The virus, the corona crisis, pandemics, we weren't prepared, we weren't ready. Huh? In many countries like the US, UK, South Africa, Brazil, their reaction has not been very good because it's based on a completely competitive extreme capitalist system. The countries that are more collective, Switzerland, for where I live, right, New Zealand, they have fared much better. I think it's quite clear that we're not going to tackle climate change here or, or artificial intelligence or genetic engineering if, if we don't find a common agenda. I think with capitalism it's quite clear it's unfit for the future, the form that we know right now. Look at these stats. I mean, we're blowing ourselves out, out to the sky here with CO2 emissions. Uh, Low-level jobs are much more likely to get lost in the crisis and people are going to become poorer and poorer. I mean, inequality is increasing pretty much all over the place, especially, of course, in the U.S. and also in Brazil. And this chart shows, you know, 400 million more people uh, are going to be in poverty because of COVID. And this was three months ago. <laughs> right? Ask again, this is an Oxfam chart. Right? And, of course, Al Gore has been talking about sustainable capitalism since, I don't know, 2011. Right? He says now we should no go, not go back to pre-pandemic thinking when we think about the future. Right? We, we should continue to think about how we can reinvent and learn from this crisis a sustainable form of capitalism. This is going to be a mission. I think that it takes a lot of doing and understanding, but this is unavoidable. This is the direction that we have to go because what used to be unthinkable is now the new normal. The government is telling us what to do, when to wear a mask, where to go, where to travel, and so on. Uh, and maybe that's going to be the same thing for the carbon tax. Right? Maybe we're going to have to pay the same money for flying on an airplane in carbon tax than we pay for the ticket. And maybe the future is vegetarian because of carbon regulation. Right? Agriculture and farming, beef, pork, Right? That's 28% of global pollution. So that's something we have to tackle. You know, I'm not a vegetarian, but I look at this chart and saying, yeah, maybe there will be alternatives, the new normal. And let's not forget this. We're going to use this crisis to create a new normal, a better normal. Right? Not, not go back. We're not going to go back to what, what there was before. We're just not. And it's going to take too long. It's going to have too many side effects. We're going to rethink energy as part of this discussion about this crisis and where are we going and when, whether we can avoid the next crisis, which of course is climate change shaping up really big, a better normal, not a back to the new normal or to the old normal. And in this sense, I think capitalism now is being reshaped uh, to look at four different points of the agenda. So not just profit and growth, but people, planet, purpose, and prosperity. All four of those. And I think we should put a new stock market in a place and we should pay executives and dividends to people and bonuses based on performance on all of those four points. Lots of people are talking about this, you know, stakeholder value, business roundtable, and so on. I propose the creation of a SUSDAQ, sustainable index, a sustainable stock market like NASDAQ. You know, four companies that sub uh, subscribe to this principle, the quadruple bottom line, the sustainable development goals only, and that's where we could all invest. I think this is an amazing opportunity, maybe for your country, but also for Europe. Right? Uh, SUSDEC. 
So let's talk about Europe and what's happening in Europe. I mean, it's quite clear that this crisis has brought us a lot of stress and discussions about what Europe actually means. But amazingly enough, I think we performed well. The European Commission, the European government, the parliament has agreed on these measures to help each other pretty much unlimited solidarity, almost. Right? And I think we're in a process of forming the United States of Europe. I know it sounds crazy when you think about all the issues about Europe, but this is our best bet. Right? It's sort of the least worst choice. You know, What is the alternative than making it work with Europe? I mean, clearly we're moving into a future where we can say, well, Europe stands for something. Right? And I think this is also the antidote to what America stands for, at least in a sort of common uh, version of, of, of the observation, and maybe China, right? we stand for holistic business models, for human-centered futures, and maybe also for a circular, sustainable economy. And this is our plus, right? Makes us slower, but I think we're going to have tens of millions of new jobs in this, in this era when we fund them. Right? Let's take the money out of military and surveillance and, and tax, the, tax, the tech companies a little bit more, to create more of a uh, revenue flow to do those things here in Europe. I think Europe has a great future and it's coming. So let me wrap up as by talking about the future mindset. First, you got to get used to pivoting. You got to get very good at pivoting and turning that boat around to figure out a new version of your current business, right? And that's sometimes right next to it, but we haven't noticed. The music industry has gone from selling records to selling the cloud. Not voluntarily, of course, <laughs> but uh, we can learn from that. You know, we should do it ourselves before somebody else does it for us. Right? Great quote here from Mark Benioff, the CEO of Salesforce, has some really smart things to say about the future. He says, you need to get to the future ahead of your customers and be ready to greet them when they arrive. I mean, keep that in mind, ahead of your customers to understand and build the future that is ready for people to come. This is crucial. Right? That is the future mindset, and Mark has that future mindset. Pretty amazing stuff. Let's get used to this. I mean, we're living in a perpetual world of VUCA. Right? Volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and it's not going to change. It was VUCA before, but now it is with Corona, even more VUCA, even more ambiguity. I mean, it's basically like, ask me again next week, and I'll give you a different answer about what the future contains. <laughs> It's utter uncertainty, and we have to feel our way forward. We have to accept, and what I call, flip the VUCA. Right? Turn that around, so let's be fast, let's be unorthodox, let's have co-creation, and let's be awesome. Right? To flip the VUCA, I think that is going to be so important in our mindset, right? and to think positive about the future. And in this vastly intersecting, confusing reality, you know, we, we have to learn how to develop these giant ears, you know, to observe, right? to perceive, to understand, to act, to create, and of course, finally, to imagine and to deliberate and to do new things. Right? Those are the four action points of, of the future mindset. So finally, I think our choice is to shape the future ourselves, to get smart about the future, to understand it, to have a future mindset, or to be shaped by it by other people creating it for us. So let's tackle the future, let's work on our future mindset, and I wish you a great rest of the conference, and I look forward to having a conversation with you later. Thank you very much for tuning in. Bye.